all these people just showing up. So. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to our service at the Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence. I'm Kathy Brown, a youth advisor and co-chair of the racial justice team, and many of our members are helping with today's service. If you are new or returning after a time away, we're glad to see you. Please feel free to fill out a blue welcome card. It looks like this, where you can and you can put it in the offering plate later in the service. There's a link to an online version in the chat, and we'll put you on our email list so that you can receive information about what we do. We strive to be a congregation that welcomes people of all ages, races, religious beliefs, backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities, and abilities. We belong to the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, and we are guided and inspired by its values and principles. Our values and principles move us to remember that those of us in the Pioneer Valley live on unceded homeland of the Potumpmuk, Nonotok, and Western Nipmuc peoples. We acknowledge our responsibility to confront the legacies of disposition and systemic racism that are part of our collective history and we affirm and celebrate the many legacies that inspire us. We're happy to welcome da Dr. David Raglan, our speaker this morning, and he will be coming shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Raglan is a scholar and activist who focuses on racial justice, reparations, and abolition. He is co-executive director of Culture, Organizing, and Reparations, and the director of Grassroots Reparations Campaign both programs of the Truth Telling Project, which he co-founded. He is also a special advisor to Congresswoman Cori Bush and other progressive politicians. Dr. Radlin will be here to answer questions after the service, and you are welcome to join us for a light lunch in the parlor at 1130. We are here to celebrate, to reflect, and to support one another. It's good to be together. And now we'll begin our service. this morning are from Nelson Mandela. I always knew that deep down in, my, in every human heart there is mercy and generosity. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love, for love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite.
Please rise in body or spirit for our chalice lighting. We will remain standing for the first hymn, We'll Build the Land. This is a time that calls for a candle in the darkness. May we kindle the flame of love, ignite the light of peace, and feed the fire of justice. sometimes a little different from what's on the screen. And that's because we took advantage of um, 
the pandemic. There were many things we took advantage of during the pandemic uh, to make the language on the, on the slides more gender inclusive. And so you'll notice, you'll notice that, that sometimes there's a difference. That's why. Good morning. Our story this morning is called An American Storm Story by Kwame Alexander. And he wrote this book because his fourth grade daughter was learning about the 13 colonies and her teacher wasn't planning to talk about slavery because she said she wasn't comfortable talking about it. So we are going to be talking about slavery this morning. He wrote this to teach kids about our, our history in America, which is why he called it an American story because it's not something we can forget. It's an important part of our history. Um, you'll notice in the book, there's some yellow pages, pages that are yellow, and those are the kids' reactions to what they're learning, which might feel similar to your reactions. So there are some heavy things in here, but some important things. Um, and I also just wanted to point out the illustrations because the artist, Dare Coulter, spent six years working on this book. And as an artist, she really strives to do art that represents black joy. And this was a very different project. So she researched about slavery. She went to Africa and she created paintings, drawings, and sculptures. So as you're, as you're looking at the pictures either on screen or if you'd like to come closer, you'll see that there are these amazing sculptures that she made in order to represent what she wanted to represent with this book. So one thing that I really love about it is it also talks about strength and perseverance and the courage to dream a new tomorrow. An American Story by Kwame Alexander. How do you tell a story that starts in Africa and ends in horror? An unbelievable story about evil plans and big guns hiding in the night, waiting. While the girls and the boys finish chores, playing games, listen to old tales of trickster spiders and talking drums, waiting. For the women to sing, everyone to sleep, for the men to dream of tomorrow, waiting. to steal them away from their lives and sell them in America. And here's one of these yellow pages. So these are some reactions. But you can't sell people. How do you tell a story about slavery? About sly men from cold places scheming and laughing on tall ships while people shackled below, crammed in small, hot spaces, cry and sometimes die. A story of struggle and sacrifice about bold men and women jumping into the sea, into the jaws of sharks, because, here's one of these yellow pages, they were scared and didn't know where they were being taken or what they'd find when they got there. Maybe they just wanted to escape. How do you tell that story about copper dreams wrapped in iron chains, about working hard for long hours from can see to can't for free? About picking cotton and growing sugar under the burning sun while blonde haired boys and girls ate their candy and played tag before school in their woolen breeches and cotton gowns and no reading aloud and no reading aloud. So it's the two different meanings of aloud. About planting corn and threshing rice and curing tobacco and harvesting coffee and cooking and cleaning and building for free. Why weren't they paid? That's not fair. How do you tell a story about strength and pride and refusing to be broken? 
and refusing to stop smiling and loving. And each night gathering the children by the fire to hear tales of Moses and trickster rabbits and missing home and missing home. That's sad, really, really sad, Miss Simmons. How do you tell that story and not want to weep for the world? A story about mothers fleeing in the wind, wading in the water, conducting freedom. About fathers fighting back, stealing away, chasing liberty. About some being caught and others riding the night by the light of the North Star. About the girls waking up in the middle of the night to their mothers pleading, please don't take my boy from me. About families torn apart, sold like cattle. I don't think I can continue, it's just too painful. I shouldn't have read this to you. I'm sorry, children. But don't you tell us to always speak the truth, Miss Simmons, even when it's hard? And these kids are making Black Lives Matter signs, and this person's right, making a sign that says, it's never too late to learn and do better. When I've done something bad, my dad always says, you can't change the past, but you can do better in the future. Whenever I'm sad, my grandma sings me her favorite poem. We've suffered, been battered, our lives have been scattered, but we're still here. And that's all that matters. We're still here. How do you tell an American story about standing up and speaking out, about Sojourner Truth and Robert Smalls, about the Civil War and emancipation, about yesterday's nightmare and the courage to dream a new tomorrow? How do you tell a story this hard to hear, one that hurts and still loves? You do it by being brave enough to lift your voice, by holding history in one hand and clenching hope in the other. And that is the end. Now it's time to greet one another. We'll say hello to everyone on Zoom. I can't see you this morning, people on Zoom. And now say hello to everyone on Zoom and then turn and greet your neighbor. a screen in front of me so I can't call out your names but it's wonderful to see you. Thank you for coming this morning. I think it's going to continue to be a really powerful time. So I'm so very, very glad you're all here. Now it's time for everyone who is leaving for religious education to part we will part ways and we will sing you out. This is a brief reading from a woman named Mia Mingus, who is a writer and educator 
and a trainer for transformative justice and for disability justice. And she writes, what if accountability wasn't scary? It will never be easy or comfortable, but what if it wasn't scary? What if our own accountability wasn't something we ran from, but something we ran towards and desired, appreciated, held as sacred? What if we cherished opportunities to take accountability as precious opportunities to practice liberation, to practice love, to practice the kinds of people, elders to be, and souls we want to be? to practice that which we can only practice in real time. After all, we can only practice courage when we're afraid. We can only practice taking accountability when we have done wrong or harmed or hurt. Practice yields the sharpest analysis. Accountability is not a destination. It is a skill we can build and practice. It is an art, a craft, an alchemy we can learn how to wield just as we have learned how to wield hurt and shame and fear. And now Kathy Lilly has a social justice minute for us. <laughs> How did you sneak in there? <laughs> this is a social justice minute in which our faith powerfully reminds us that we are called to service and to our higher selves and inspired to better our world. Our congregation is home to powerful social justice ministries through our climate action group, the, our USNF, the vote group, the racial justice team, our generous share the plate offerings to external groups doing meaningful work and our interfell help fund. And don't forget our help to Haiti and to our partner church in Transylvania. But today I wanna to give a shout out to the activists who maintain this community so that social justice warriors can have a place to call home and an institutional megaphone to amplify their voices. I want to give a shout out to those who serve on the Board of Trustees, on the Council, on the Finance Committee, the Stewardship Committee, or as chairs and teams and committees, also to those who teach religious education classes and serve on the RE Council. I want to give a shout out to the House and Property Committee and the Safe Relations Task Force, and to the Web Committee, the Social Media Team, and the Pastoral Care Team. I want to give a shout out to the volunteers who make Sunday services possible, the worship committee, the tech team, the greeter team, the welcome team. And thanks to all of you who show up in the pews and online and who ultimately support this congregation with your presence and your financial support. Without this internal structure supporting the infrastructure of our community, our voice of justice for the world and our attempts to better the world would falter. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Now I invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 134, Our World is One World.
And now Jeremy Gantz has a testimonial. Hello. It's my first time in a pulpit. So I think I'm going to overcome my fear of public speaking. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gantz. You may have seen me before here at services with my wife, Caitlin, and our daughter, Lula, who loves waving to all the people in Zoom land, and our son, Augie, who often has his head down reading a graphic novel. Uh, the invitation to offer this testimonial to articulate why we have pledged support for the annual stewardship campaign <clears throat> has given me the chance to consider what the special place means to me. I am both a new member and a not so new member of this congregation. A new member in the sense of having officially finally signed the membership book last fall. But in fact, we began attending meetings in 2018. Back then, I admit that part of the appeal was an hour long break from parenting. Lula was only 18 months old then. We took a break from services during the pandemic. Zoom just didn't work so well with our kids. Then we took another break during the first half of last year while living in Costa Rica during Caitlin's sabbatical. After returning home to Northampton last summer, I've had a renewed appreciation for all that this community is and offers us. From the beginning, its generous, inclusive, and playful spirit, its vision and pursuit of a more just world pulled me in. Here are the three main reasons I'm happy to make our first annual pledge in support of the stewardship campaign. First, this congregation's commitment to social justice deeply aligns with my values, and it challenges me to live up to them, to make them more than just words and gestures. We live in a world grappling with widespread injustices, and change will only come through sustained collective action. This congregation is part of that. Second, this congregation is helping our two children become thoughtful, socially engaged people. One of the things I've come to believe since becoming a parent is that parents shouldn't be solely responsible for the moral education of their children. It's just too much pressure. Busy working parents can't do it all. And I'm so happy that our children will grow up with a strong moral and spiritual foundation built through USNF. I'm confident they will know how to care for others, to value community service, and to see our shared humanity in everyone they encounter in life. We are so grateful for the religious education program here and all that it offers. And finally, I love that values and principles form US, USNF's DNA, not doctrine and dogma. I was raised Catholic and I was never confirmed in the church, having developed a dislike of centralized authority and patriarchy and a habit of asking a lot of questions. In the years to follow, I studied Buddhism, I flirted with atheism, and later Episcopalianism. In recent years, I find myself returning to the wisdom of Buddhist teachings. So I'm a kind of a wandering agnostic, but now I feel I can wander at home, so to speak, in this place. Here, intellectual freedom and an abiding sense of all-inclusive love are in the air. Here, answers to the most important questions can be found in any of the world's religious traditions. What matters most is that we ask the questions. To me, they are just as important as the answers. I'm grateful for the chance to gather here, to share the search for meaning and for justice, and to feel less alone in life's challenges and joys. We are all stronger together. I invite you to think deeply about what this community, this organization means to you. Why are you here today? What would you miss if it disappeared? And what can you afford to contribute to ensure it continues to thrive. Thanks. I don't think this is Jeremy's last turn in the pulpit. <laughs> Thank you. What are we doing now? Oh, now it's time for our offering. That's a tradition that goes way back, something we do every week. And our generosity of spirit, time, and money make everything we do here possible. Our weekly offering is shared 50-50 between the work of the congregation and the work of organizations beyond our walls. And we've been choosing two sets of organizations every year. And the order of meeting that you have in your hand is not up to date. 
So we just voted, the Coordinating Council just voted on our new recipients for the rest of this year. Thank you, thank you to everyone who submitted suggestions. Um, at last Monday's Coordinating Council, attendees voted to support the Northampton Trans Relocation Fund, Springfield's Martin Luther King Jr. Family Services, UU Mass Action, the Center for Common Ground, and the Indian Resource Law Center. Our offering will now be given and very, very gratefully received. The uh, original writer of what I'm going to share for the meditation is unknown. The person who changed it is known. I am afraid of many things. Of ongoing and growing threats, threats to peace and human dignity of climate change, of personal darkness, of loneliness. I am more afraid of what I might become, reconciled to injustice, resigned to fear and despair. Let my fears dissolve. Let my hopes be unchained. Stretch me towards the impossible that I may work for what ought to be. Wrongs made right, suffering lightened, peace one day realized. We'll take a moment together in silence.
Now I'm very happy to welcome Dr. David Ragland to talk with us. His title is Talk, A Spiritual Movement of Hope, Reparations, and Abolition. So. Get into it. You don't have to have your face in. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for playing Deep River. I didn't know if I was going to make it up here because my uncle sang that song. Um, so I was hearing his voice, my great uncle, Eugene Holmes. And um, so I just. I want to just start by honoring my ancestors. I'm going to honor those folks who were enslaved on this land, those ancestors, the millions that we usually don't speak about, who ended up at the bottom of the Atlantic, the indigenous ancestors of this land, the Nipmunk. Kuntuk, those unmourned and mourned losses in the pandemic. I honor and pray for peaceful transition and for the thousands and thousands of Black, Indigenous, Palestinian, and Latinx made into martyr martyrs because of white supremacy doesn't believe in their humanity. To my grandmamas. To this land that holds us up. This land is alive. 
Land is not an it. Land is alive. Whoever told us that land should be owned lied to us. How do you own living beings? How do you own life? It's my pleasure, I, I talk, this is one of the courses I, based on the course that I teach and some writing that I'm doing around reparations and spiritual practice. If you wanna check it out, there's an article in a journal called PRISM called uh, Reparations and Abolition, similarly titled A Movement of Hope. And I know hope seems really difficult right now, let alone reparations being hope for us. But I'm here to tell you some good news that it is. It's always been a distance between the demands of justice and the unjust laws that we live under. But hope is the belief in a different future. Hope is similar to faith. Hope is also grounded in love. Baldwin, James Baldwin called this kind of love, not like this personal flimsy love, but a state of being, a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense, but it's a love that holds the world together on a tiny string. The reason why we're still here is because of hope, hope from the people that love, that continue to hold us together. Love gives us hope and that all is not lost. Imagine if we didn't have hope or love. What would Belinda Royale have done in, 18, in 1783 here in Massachusetts if she didn't have love or hope. She had love for herself and a belief and love for her entire humanity, which gave her hope that if she presented a petition to the Massachusetts General Assembly, that they would hear her demands. And this enslaved woman, Belinda Royal, upon the death of her enslaver, requested the Massachusetts General Assembly that she have a pension so that she can live off of her enslaver's estate. And it was granted. Or would David Walker in 1830 have presented his appeal? Would he have had the bravery to tell the truth about America? The Americans have to raise us from the conditions of brutes to that of respectable men and make a national acknowledgement to us for the wrongs they have inflicted on us. Sometimes that hope doesn't go so well, but he had it. Or in 1865, when General William T. Sherman had the sense enough to ask black ministers outside of Savannah, who had recently been emancipated. What do you need? And he had the sense enough to listen. And he said, we need land and animals so we can make our own life, so that we can be 
we won't be molested by our former enslavers. And he in issued field number, field order number 15 that allocated 40 acres and a mule. Or Henrietta Woods in 1870. She successfully free sued her enslavers for reparations. Or 1898, Callie House and Isaiah Dickinson, who ordered the National Ex Slave Mutual Bounty and Relief Pension Fund to provide a pension, a pension for formerly enslaved folks for their burial cost, folks who had nothing. Although she was imprisoned by the US government because they said, well, we don't believe a black woman could do this. So it has to be fraud. But can you imagine having hope and love on top of continued violence and hatred? Or in 1919, under the leadership of Marcus Garvey, the Universal Negro Improvement Association basically made a claim, one of the modern day claim for reparations and call what's happening in America, apartheid and terrorism against black folks. Or in 1951, when Paul Robeson, William Patterson, W.E. Du Bois launched a campaign entitled We, Ca we Charge Genocide. And they took it to the United Nations and charged the United States with genocide for its ongoing genocidal treatment of black folks in this country. And on and on and on, but in 1959, when Queen Mother Audley Moore founded the modern day reparations movement, the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women and also presented a, a case for genocide, particularly against the United States for its ongoing and even assisted treatment of the trafficking and rape of black women and black girls. Then in 1969, at the National Black Economic Conference, which, entered, which issued the Black Manifesto. And the Black Manifesto was a call to American congregations to demand reparations for its complicity in the slave trade, as many churches were essentially slush funds for slaveholders. They did this because their love for humanity and that love translates into a hope that when confronted with the truth given out of love of what they were experiencing, because who in their right mind will risk telling their enslavers the truth about themselves? As Ida B. Wells called it, telling the truth helps shed light on darkness. And it's why part of my primary work is about truth and reconciliation. It's why in 2014, after Mike Brown was murdered by Ferguson police officers, in my hometown of Ferguson, Missouri, right near St. Louis, Missouri, the now Congresswoman Cori Bush and I started the Ferguson Truth Telling Project to hear about truths, experiences from people around the country 
who had experienced police violence. And for three years, we carried on series of truth telling and hearings documenting those stories. And in 2017, we were finishing one of the hearings and we had a drummer who opened the ceremony and we were standing in the back of a church and he had told me, you know, this is the 100th anniversary of the East St. Louis race massacre. And how many people have heard about that? Right, the turn of the century um, up until the 40s, hundreds of massacres around the United States happened where black folks land were stolen by their white neighbors. We're just seeing the 100 year anniversary of Tulsa. Folks who were enslaved by the Muskegee Creek Nation able to build wealth even after enslavement and their white neighbors jealous of their progress burned and murdered them but this man was telling me about how he may not be alive today that day in 2017 if his grandparents hadn't escaped on a rickety boat across the mississippi river because the missouri patrol Missouri State Patrol were turning away black folks who were coming across the bridge. And in that massacre, that massacre was started because Northern factory owners during World War I had been recruiting blacks to come up from the South to work at lower rates. And then a lie about a black man touching or looking at a white woman wrong turned into hundreds of murders black mothers thrown back into burning houses no one held responsible in that moment me and congresswoman bush we thought it was impossible to talk about or tell the truth unless reparations were on the table. We began to think about this notion that reparations is the midpoint between truth and reconciliation. In the book, Dear White Christians, the author says, if white people want racial reconciliation, they should pay reparations. But many get scared when they hear that. They, they get scared. Not because reparations hadn't been paid before, because Lincoln paid reparations to DC enslavers for the loss of the cost of their property my people, my ancestors, or not because it hasn't happened in our world and isn't happening as a result of the Holocaust. Western nations continue to pay reparations to our Jewish brothers and sisters, or not because even in the United States, minority communities don't deserve reparations because in 19, 86, with the support of black legislators, the Japanese Americans were able to receive reparations for their internment during World War II, because America thought all Japanese people may, were likely working with the Japanese government. But reparations, People find that a scary word because at the core of reparations is something very basic. 
a belief in the human dignity of all people. The belief in the moral value and worth of our neighbors and ourselves. People are afraid of it because they are afraid that we will do what you have always done to us, despite what we have always shown you. In South Carolina, those black folks murdered in that church. They forgave. Even when we were doing the truth telling project, we didn't focus on forgiveness because I believe that forgiveness is a political act. And I have to forgive in my heart to move forward, to live in this world. But I don't believe you can force the people to publicly forgive someone who has shown time and time again that the only time we pass your laws is when it is convenient for us. But what if Americans understood reparations as much more? As about a completion of an abolition process that began a long time ago of closing loops that still allow slavery in our current day through imprisonment. Of fulfilling what freedom actually means. What if we understood reparations as an opening rather than a closing? Or if we understood reparations in the way that the UN describes it, as not just money, but healing, the return of what was stolen, truth telling about the past and the present, They also look at it as healing the spiritual, mental, physical harm of enslavement. One of the reasons why I always begin and couch my work in my ancestors is because it is part of a spirituality that was stolen from my people. But also the final piece of what the UN describes reparations is a guarantee of non-repeat. Oh, I'm so hopeful that we don't repeat this no more. What if we could stop doing the things that got us to where we are. What would that look like? It wouldn't just look like saying I'm an anti-racist. It wouldn't just look like being friendly to black folks or inviting brown folks into your congregation. It looks like a deep unraveling of our complicity in a system that created and maintains and was built on theft of land bodies, theft of people, continued colonization and support of colonization in places like Israel, 
on Palestinian land. In places like Puerto Rico, that is a colony, or Hawaii, or Fuji, guarantees of non-repeat means unraveling. It is a spiritual practice, I believe, a decolonial practice. I often wonder, what do I do when I meet the creator and I say, I was just complicit. I didn't, I didn't really know that this investment in my retirement account was supporting the creation of weapons. or the building of prisons, or that this hotel that I am staying in allows ICE to secret away migrants looking for a better life in the middle of the night, or that this airline, Delta, is supporting the building of a prison industrial complex cop city in Atlanta or Home Depot is supporting that as well to create hyper surveillance cities around the country. Guarantees of non repeat is a core of reparations. It requires us to look into our practices daily. People get mad when you say, oh, you want reparations because it's just about money. You want money. But money is energy or currency, and currency is energy and spirit. What we spend our money on speaks to the condition of our soul not just what we put in the church basket and the organizations of that it supports for good, not the random philanthropy, but the core of how I use my money, my investments, places that I go, institutions that I support. And I began in, in 2021, or I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but after this man had told Corey and I and others about his family history, we ended up launching a campaign around reparations, specifically in churches, calling on the work of James Foreman, who remember I said in 1969, the National Conference created this Black Manifesto. James Foreman went to Riverside Church in April of 1969. James Foreman was a well-known SNCC activist. And he demanded on the, interrupted the service and demanded reparations from those churches, from national congregations and synagogues for their role in enslavement. And that inspired us to think more deeply because we had always been supported in our organizing around and by faith-based communities because they got it. They let us use their institutions when there were in, in Charlottesville, it was a synagogue that held us and prevented the Nazis marching on the streets. from hurting us and harming us. And we, so we knew that 
there was still justice some places. Jeremy got up and he, he talked about that and it touched me. And I believe that role of churches and congregations in doing the work. If congregations don't do the work that America needs to transform itself, then who else will? So we launched this campaign and we began asking congregations of all faiths to think about where does reparations emerge in their faith tradition and to begin holding services and thinking about reparations as a faith based project, as a spiritual practice, as a daily walk as a concept core to our basic humanity and decency that if I do something wrong or if I benefit from harm or the harm of my ancestors or a structure of harm that lives off of the bodies and labors of others, then I have a duty, a moral urgency that requires me to think about and begin the reparative work of the unraveling myself from complicity. To become accountable. What if America was accountable? And that's what, why I come to you thinking this is about hope. Because a few few years ago, I met these two psychologists, Brian Colony Connolly, and Medria Evans, doctors, and they wrote an article describing the need for America to transform its ghost. And what they argue is that because America and many Americans have experienced and witnessed, even if under the covers or under the radar, they know that something is wrong, that because one group of people are able to live well, to be treated well, and that is at the cost of another group. And there's a story similar to that called the Amilas. But this sense of knowing causes what other psychologists call moral injury. When you know even if you weren't a part of it, or if you witness a great tragedy, you are not left unharmed. You injure yourself. You injure your soul. One therapist working on folks coming out of Vietnam, and that's where that concept of moral injury comes from, is because so many soldiers have witnessed great tragedies in war and they were coming back with something beyond a post-traumatic stress it was a kind of breaking a rupturing of who they thought they were a moral injury a breakage of the soul and this even and this is this can be vicarious. And when we encounter and experience this breaking, what these psychologists suggest can heal it, can address the lingering ghost, 
because of this moral injury is atonement. Reparations is a form of a, a atonement. Truth telling, acknowledgement, reparations for one's person, oneself, for one's community. And this is how we transform ghost into ancestors. This is, this is what we want to do. That's the hope that we can transform the lingering ghost that keep us stuck in the same position of war against the other until we transform those ghosts, abolish the prisons, the police, the police in our minds, abolish the colonies, we'll be stuck with ghosts that lead us into war and plunder. But the good news is that there is a way out. And the way out is not just about cutting a check. It is about the spiritual work of undoing, learning and lifting the veil that won't allow us to see each other as human, but something that allows us to reconnect to each other and this planet, that allows us to be a part of as opposed to dominate over. This is the spiritual journey that I'm walking on, the journey of the reparationist, reparations and abolition that I invite you all into. And thank you for hearing my words today. final hymn this morning is come and go with me it's 1018 in the teal hymnal we're on the screen i invite you to rise and body your spirit and join in singing
Our closing words are from the Reverend Jody Cohen Hayashida. May we as a nation stop turning from the truth of who we have been and who we are. May we find the courage to step into the horror and the grief that will arise from that knowledge. And may we allow it to turn us toward repentance, reparations, and a collective demand for justice. So our postlude music this morning is from a mu musician named Benjamin Mer Mertz, and it's called Tear Your Kingdom Down. And we have him on video uh, singing it, performing it. We're gonna watch the video once to uh, appreciate his artistry and uh, uh, take in the form of it. And then we're gonna play it again so we don't want to just be observers, we want to be participants. And we're going to play it again, and we're all going to sing it with him. And John and Dave are going to join me up front, and we'll guide you uh, through the singing part the second time around. So we can start the video now. Hatred, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oh, hatred, we gonna tear your kingdom down. We gonna tear down your kingdom all over this land. Oh, hatred, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Racism, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Racism, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oh, you've been building up your kingdom all over this land. But racism, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Police violence, we gonna tear your kingdom, tear your kingdom, tear your police violence, we gonna tear your kingdom down. We gonna tear down your kingdom all over this land. Police violence, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oppression, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oppression, we gonna tear your kingdom down. We gonna tear down your kingdom. We're gonna tear down your kingdom. We're gonna tear down your kingdom. We gonna tear down your We gonna tear your kingdom down. Hatred, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oh, hatred, we gonna tear your kingdom down. We're gonna tear down your kingdom. Oh, hatred, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Racism, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Racism, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oh, you've been building up 
your kingdom. Oh, but it's the land, but racism, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Police violence, we gonna tear your kingdom down. A police violence, we gonna tear your kingdom down. We gonna tear down your kingdom all over this land. Police violence, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Ha. Oppression, we gonna tear your kingdom down. Oppression, we gonna tear your kingdom down. We gonna tear down your kingdom. We're gonna tear down your kingdom. We're gonna tear down your kingdom. We're gonna tear down your We're gonna tear your kingdom down.